Okay, looks like we're recording, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome back to 142. Um, for this lecture, I often begin with a bit of a gimmick. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I, you know, it's too confusing, I think, when we're recording. But, you know, many of you may have noticed that I'm using my Mac laptop, you know, for recording. And I have a little adapter that's kind of sticking out of my Mac so that it's sending out a video signal. And then there's a, a cord over here that I've plugged into that goes into this system here that, you know, projects it and records it for you to watch. And so what I do sometimes as the gimmick is I disconnect my adapter from the cord and I'm all confused. There's nothing on the screen for you. There'd be nothing being recorded for the screen. I'm so confused. Can anyone help me understand what's going on? Uh, anyway, as I say, it's a gimmick, you know, it's a little, a little stupid in a way, but I actually do think it's relevant to what we're going to be talking about in today's lecture and what you'll be doing in the homework assignment which is, I mean, you've probably often been to, to places like this where, you know, there's a technical difficulty. They can't project what they meant to project. And it's almost always some weird kind of connection or something that's not set right. So it's somewhat notoriously difficult to get everything right. Now, that's a very simplistic one. But, you know, I try to get students to say what's going on. And they'll say things like, well, you don't have it connected. And I say, well, the Mac is producing the video out signal. Why doesn't that work? Well, because it's not getting over there. Well, over there, I've said that it should take what comes from the, the, this cord. Well, because you didn't put the two together. There was a broken link. So anyway, that's an idea that I'm going to come back to. And it seems really obvious to you here, you know, with a, with a case like that. Um, I think in the programming case, as you're learning, it's not so obvious. You know, once you get good at this, if you've practiced it a lot, then you'll say, oh, it's so obviously a kind of a broken connection. That's not going to necessarily be so obvious the first time around. So anyway, I'm going to keep reminding you of that idea because it's one of the ones that I see students struggle with the most. And so I want to try to do everything I can to try to ease that pain uh, to get you to the point where you can understand it. All right, we have our question of the day results. Uh, not that, I was going to say a somewhat of a split decision, but not so much. You know, Squirtle's pretty popular. Uh, so that was a kind of a fun question from the last time. Um, I did want to point out that I have posted uh, homework four, so that's available to you now. Uh, it's due Tuesday of next week, uh, and it goes through chapter four of the book. Okay, so there's some various things I want to do in JGRASP. I want to begin with an example. We're going to talk about some issues having to do with if and if else. So I introduced that at the end of the last lecture, kind of in their simple form. If, you know, says if something is true, do this, these lines of code. And in the if else form, you know, you do one of two different sets of code. Well, I've got some code here uh, where I've put some lines of code in a method here where uh, uh, I'm passing in a value of n, and I'm trying to change n. So if it's less than 0, I add 1. If it's 0, I set it to 1,000. If it's greater than 0, I, I do minus minus. So I mean, this is kind of stupid little you know, update. But I guess what I had in mind was a kind of a, a one-dimensional video game where the sun is at zero, and so if you're, you know, if you're at negative something, you're being drawn towards the sun by gravity, so that's why negative numbers go up by one, so they get closer to zero, and positive numbers get drawn down towards zero, so that's why if you're at a positive number, it goes down towards zero. Uh, that's why we get the minus minus, and if you, uh, if you ever end up flying into the sun, you end up with an n of zero, then uh, who knows, you go through some kind of a wormhole or something and you end up with an n of a thousand. So kind of three different cases, you're either being drawn upward if you're negative, you're being drawn downward if you're positive, and you kind of fly away to a place far away uh, when you run into the zero. So I've got a little bit of code here that does a prompt and read, and then it calls the updating method and it reports the updated n afterwards. So let's compile and run this version, and let me give it uh, an 18 here. So I'm going to say uh, I want you to, uh, to update my 18. And so uh, here, uh, an 18, it's not negative, it's not 0, it's greater than 0. 18 would have been updated to 17. That's what should have happened. So this should be a 17. And it's, it's not. It's an 18. So that's kind of the first. The uh, question is kind of what's going on here that the update see didn't seem to take hold. 
Um, if I had a little more time for this example, I'd show you how in the JGRAS debugger we could set a stop. We've seen doing that. You can set a stop at the end of this method to kind of see whether n has been properly updated. And what you would find is that n has been properly updated. So n really is 17 at the end of this method. Uh, so the question is, how come it's, it's not changed to 17 here? Well, we've talked about this idea. So this has to do with information flow. This major topic of, and theme of today's lecture is the information flow. There's a new value of n that we've computed at the end of this method. And that new value of n needs to be, uh, needs to escape the method. It needs to, it, we don't want it trapped inside this method. Local variables just go away at the end of a method, and we don't want to do that. Well, how do you get a value out of a method? We've been talking about that. You use a return. So you say return n. That means we have to change the return type, int. So we return n, and if we come back here and run it again, we'd say, so it's going to change the n here. No. Uh, we could do it, we'd see, you know, but it's the same. It's not updating the n. And what I claim is that it's a lot like this case where I said, you know, kind of, you know, so look, uh, it's like my Mac that would be sending a signal, you know, this method is sending out an N, the 17 is being passed back to main, and main's got this N, you know, that, that could uh, be updated, but I never closed the connection. I never kind of completed the connection here. Uh, this is, I've said it's like the pizza delivery thing. This update method is trying to deliver a pizza to us. It's trying to return an N to us, which is an updated N, and we never told it what to do with that N that value that's kind of being returned to us. We want to update, that we want to change n. We want to store that new value in n. You know, just like the way you say n equals n plus one. You know, we want n to become this new value. So if there's an updated n that's being returned to us by the method, then we want to store that back into our variable n. So let's try compiling and running that version. And let's see if that fixes so our 18 got updated to a 17. So now it's working. Now we've got the information flow working right. Um, there's another issue with this method that I wanted to talk about, and that is that I had in mind that you do one of these three things, but that's not how the code behaves. Uh, it, it, there are some cases that are somewhat odd. So normally I'd ask you know, the audience for examples of what might turn out in an odd way. Uh, you're not here, so I have to kind of give examples. Think about what happens when it's zero. So what's supposed to happen when n is zero is that n is supposed to be updated to 1,000. So if I type in a zero, I expect to see an updated n of 1,000, and instead I see an updated n of 999. That's strange. There's an even weirder case, again, I'd ask, but there's you know, no audience here to, to, to tell me. If I give it minus one. Minus one is supposed to be updated, drawn closer to zero. You know, minus one is supposed to turn into a zero. So that's kind of what it should be. But if I do that, I get 999 for minus one. That one's truly weird. You know, why would a minus one produce 999? Well, so one of the things that uh, chapter four mentions, and this is in the slides for today, there's a, m a much more careful discussion in the slides and in the chapter than what I have time to do here in lecture. So I'm gonna tell you more the, a quick version of it and kind of the bottom line of what you're gonna wanna know in terms of doing your programming assignments. But this is an issue that programmers deal with often, where there are various kinds of alternatives and you know, to choose from. And you want some combination of those things, potentially. And there are different kinds of structures that you can come up with. So uh, in, in particular, we create what are known as nested if-else structures. So these are three classic structures that we want you to be familiar with. This leftmost one is the one that I have in the current program, where it's just if, if, if. Three simple ifs, no else's at all, so there's no nesting going on here. This is just three simple ifs. So think about it. How many of these statements might get executed? Well, this test might evaluate to true, in which case we'd execute that code. This test might evaluate to true, in which case we execute that code. This test might evaluate to true, in which case we execute this code. And that's, in fact, what's happening here. When n is a negative, you know, when n is negative one, negative one is less than zero, so it turns it into a zero. 
but then it finds that n is now a zero, so it changes it to 1,000, and then it finds that 1,000 is greater than zero, so it subtracts one from it. So it does all three. It executes all three of those things. That is not what I had in mind. What I had in mind is that it would do one of these three, not combinations, not multiple times. So the if, if, if leaves open the possibility that every single one gets executed. But it also leaves open the possibility that none of them get executed, because all of the tests might fail. I mean, the right way of thinking of it is that any combination of these things might execute in the case of a simple if, if, if. Now, there are cases where that's what you want to do. Uh, in Monday's lecture, we did a variation of the ball program where we had it bouncing you know, off of walls, you know, so bouncing off of the, the left and the right wall, bouncing off the top and the bottom wall. And we used an if followed by an if. So, it, you know, what, what's the combination that we want there? Would you ever want it to, to change both x and y direction? You know, that's kind of a question for that. And the answer is yes, if it went into a corner, you'd want it to kind of go backwards in both the x and the y. So that's a case where sometimes we don't want to do any of the changes. Uh, we don't want to update uh, the x or the y direction. You know, we don't want to update either. Sometimes we want to update one, but not the other. And sometimes we want to update both. So that's actually a case where if, if, if makes sense. So, you know, it's not that that doesn't come up. That might be a reasonable thing to do. Here's an alternative that uses the nesting, you know, the idea of an if else inside of an if else. So let's just kind of do a quick, you know, discussion of it. As I said, slides and chapter have a much more careful description of this. So if some test evaluates to true, it executes these statements. So that's one possibility. And everything else is inside of an else. So all of the rest of the structure is part of an else. So uh, if, the, if the, the first test evaluates to true, we execute those statements and then we're done. So we only execute those first statements. Otherwise, we go into the else part, which itself has an if, where we perform a test. If that one evaluates to true, then we execute those statements. And we'd be done because everything that follows is inside of an else. If not, we do the third test. And if it evaluates to true, we execute these statements. So the nesting aspect of this uh, means that we're not going to execute more than one. So once we execute one, every other, everything else from the construct is inside of an else, and we don't, we don't execute that. So this is a very common structure that programmers use. In some programming languages, they even combine the words else and if into a keyword ilsif, you know? So there are some, uh, some structures, or some languages that, that make this even more formal than what we're doing here in Java. So we would want you to be familiar with this alternative. So none of these, you know, it's never going to execute more than one. So not like the if, if, if. It's never going to execute more than one. Is it always going to execute a statement? And the answer to that one is no, because it might be that all of the tests fail, in which case you don't end up executing any of these statements. So kind of the right way of understanding this middle one is that it executes zero or one of these branches. Well, the final variation is instead of having an else followed by an if test, you just have an else with no test. So the final branch is done with an else, which means it always goes into that final branch if the other tests had failed. So this final version of it is one that will always execute exactly one of your different uh, options. So that's kind of this third version. Marty in the slides uh, describes these different cases, as I said, in a lot of great detail. He also has a nice summary slide where he's showing you these three major structures that we want you to be familiar with. This one is exactly one, this is zero or one, this is any number of the different paths. So this is a great little summary slide to keep in mind. Um, I've been trying to point this out to you whenever I can. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about style. So this is something that we're going to grade on in terms of style, starting with this very first program that involves if elses. Uh, I've been trying to repeat this idea that style can be annoying, but it also could be a way in which you could distinguish yourself. If you're watching these lectures, you're paying attention, you're writing notes to yourself about some of the different style issues, you will know that you've got to get this right in program four in order to get the full style credit. So you're going to be thinking about this. And so the question you should be asking yourself for these different cases is, how many branches might I want to execute? 
Is it any combination of the branches? Is it zero or one, or is it exactly one? That's the question that a TA would ask you if, they, if you lost points and you complained to the TA. They'd say, well, how many of these things might you want to execute, and did you root, choose the right structure based on that answer? Well, here I want exactly one to be executed. So what I should have done is I should have chosen the structure that has if, else if, ending in an else. So I should have cho chosen that structure because I want exactly one of these to execute. So let's change this to uh, else if, and then we'll change this, and then we want the final branch to be an else, not to have an if, uh, and so actually I'm gonna get rid of the word if, but what I can do with the test that I had there is that that can turn into a comment. That's a nice thing to kind of let people know is I know that if it's not the other two cases, the only other possibility is that n is greater than zero. So this is using that structure where exactly one of these things will be executed. So that's the way that I want to do this. Uh, if I compile and run, if I now give it um, a zero, zero changes to a thousand, which is what I wanted. And if I give it a minus one, minus one changes to a zero, which is what I wanted. And I could try others to verify, but you know, that's gonna make that work right. Okay, so that's one example I wanted to give you. And uh, so understanding these nested structures and choosing the right structure is very important. I wanna now show you one more example. So suppose we did a second update here. So let me go ahead and uncomment these lines of code. So I'm updating n again, uh, and there's you know, some things here that say if it's negative, I, I uh, add a 42 to it. Uh, otherwise, I, I add in a negative 13. I mean, this is a silly little uh, example. It's not, not really a practical one. Uh, it's it's going to be more about the lines of code and the issues that are involved here. But like if I gave it an 18, that 18 initially gets updated to a 17. You know, that was what the, the first update method did, was it did that end update. You know, 18 got updated to 17. And then it did the second update, uh, and it was updating a 17 by negative 13. And so... Uh, you can see that the 17 updated by negative 13 is 17, still a 17, unchanged. Well, I basically just did the same thing a second time. I'm just trying to really reinforce this idea that if there is a, a new value of n that needs to be used later, so if that's true, there's kind of an updated value of n, I've changed n here, changed n here, and I want to remember that change, well then that requires some information flow that requires me to return that n from this method. And that will require me to have an int here in, as the return type to return the n. And again, back in main, uh, I've got to complete the connection, you know, that it's not enough to just call the method. I have to take the value that's being passed back by the method and update my variable n to have that value. So that, that I would have to do that as well. Let's kind of take a look and see what it does. And if I gave it an 18, so uh, there was the first update that changed it to a 17. The second update, you know, updated it by negative 13, and sure enough, the 17 turned into a four. So that's good. So I've got the information flow working right. Um, but there's other things about this method that are not so good. So normally I'd ask people for, you know, opinions that you have and so forth. Uh, can you spot stuff here? There's an issue here of redundancy. And it's going to involve something that we refer to as if-else factoring. So you'll see this mentioned in the slides. You'll see a whole section of, uh, in, the, in the chapter on it about if-else factoring. And again, those of you who want to kind of remember all the little rules for uh, style, I'm going to tell you that we are going to grade on if-else factoring starting with this first homework four. So we expect you to get the if-else factoring right. So this is something you want to understand. So distinguish yourself relative to other students. Know that it needs to be done. Uh, if this goes too quick or something, you can uh, read the, the notes, I mean, read the slides, read, the, read the, the textbook about it, ask your TA about it, ask in section. But here's the idea. All right, so what's going on with a conditional? 
In a conditional, we're basically moving along, executing, executing, executing various lines of code, and then we kind of branch. We go in different directions. So there's kind of something happening over here and something happening over here. Well, what if when you look at the two branches, say, and you look at the very first thing that's being done in the two branches, what if it's exactly the same thing? And that's true here. There's a println, special update in progress, special update in progress. That's the top thing, the first thing in each of the two branches. Why is it in the branches? You know, if it's exactly the same either way, why didn't it occur before the branches? So why not have one occurrence of that before the branches? So let me take this line of code and let me cut it from here and let me put it before the if else. And I've got to fix the, the indentation there and then I can get rid of it here. So instead of having two copies of that println, one in each branch, move it up. You know, so that's factoring at the top of a branch, the top of an if-else structure. Uh, we can't factor at the top anymore because here we're setting change to 42 and here we're setting change to negative 13. So those are different. So that's good. That should be in the branch then. I think the part that's different should be what's in the branch. But there's another idea for if-else factoring, which is the bottom. You know, they you know, kind of got the branches, they execute various lines of code, and then they come back together. What if the very last thing done in each of the two branches is exactly the same? Well, then that doesn't need to be in the branches. That could be outside of the if-else branches. And that's true of this println right here, updated by change, updated by change. That's exactly the same line of code at the bottom of each of these two branches. And in fact, there's two lines of code that are exactly the same at the bottom of these two branches. Setting n to n plus change and doing the println, setting n to n plus change and doing the println. So let's do the same thing. Let me cut this from here and let me paste it in here. That means I have to adjust, I'm gonna use shift tab in JGrasp to, you know, to move it back to kind of adjust the indentation. And then I don't need two copies. I only need one copy. So this is much shorter, you know, it's getting better. Uh, we do the println for the special update. We do a branch, you know, where we're setting change. We come back together and do these other two lines of code. So look at how much shorter this is. This is much nicer. This is the kind of thing we want to do. Uh, there is going to be an issue that comes up. So let's see what happens when we go to compile. And what it says is cannot find symbol variable change and it's pointing right here. It's pointing at this line after the if else where we're trying to use change. Well, that's because I declared int change here and I declared int change here. So that would say that they're inside of these curly braces, the changes inside of those curly braces. So that's the scope issue. It's limited in scope and it can't see it outside. Now, I think that some of you, when you come up against something like this, you're gonna be inclined to say, oh, well then let me put these two lines of code that involve change, let me put them back into the if-else structure because I, I need to be able to use the local variable that's in each branch. That's the wrong way to think. We want you to do the if-else factoring. It's important to do the if-else factoring. And when you do that, you're gonna come up with situations like this where the different branches might be manipulating this variable called change and some lines of code after the branching involve that variable change. So the point is, you can't declare it inside like this. It needs to be declared in the outer scope. So we need to say int change here in the outer scope. So that means we don't want to be saying int change here. We want, and we don't want to be saying int change here. This is a common situation that comes up. So uh, uh, this is worth, you know, kind of, uh, puzzling over a little bit, making sure you understand it, that, you know, uh, uh, this looks a little weird. We're basically saying, look, I'm going to be using a variable called change. Let me tell you that much. Int change semicolon. Then I've got my little branching code that's supposed to give a value to change. And then I've got my lines of code that use that variable change. So this is a common pattern. You're going to have to get used to it. Uh, we'll see this uh, later on. Might even come up in your homework form, depending upon how you write it. When we go to compile, it gives me a different error. Variable change 
might not have been initialized. What do you mean it might not have been initialized? We set it to 42 here and negative 13 here, right? And every number is either less than zero or greater than or equal to zero. It's either gonna do one of those branches or the other, kind of guaranteed that it's gonna do one or the other, right? Well, maybe from a logical point of view, that's true. We know that it's gonna do one of those branches or the other, but Java doesn't know that it's gonna do one of the branches or the other. From Java's point of view, it sees this as a nested if-else structure that ends in an if. A nested if-else structure that ends in an if. That was this one over here. Nested if-else that ends in an if, and it says zero or one of those might be executed. So Java is thinking to itself, what if both tests fail? Well, then you don't end up setting change. Uh, I mean, we could kind of fix this up by giving an initial value to change of zero or something like that. I mean, there's various things you could do. But when you get a message like this, this is kind of an indication that maybe, maybe you, you haven't been thinking through these different issues of, you know, how many paths are executed and doing just the right thing. Because really, I chose the wrong structure. I, I should have chosen the, the, the structure that ends in an else. That doesn't end in a test, it ends in an else. I should have just done uh, if else. And that way the compiler can see that exactly one of these is going to be executed. It's either going to set it to this or it's going to set it to this. So no matter what, change will have a value when we get here. And notice, sure enough, when I go ahead and compile, it compiles properly. And I could run and you'd see that it runs properly. This is a kind of subtle point, but it's, a, it's an important one to understand, and it tends to come up, tends to really confuse people. There is a section in chapter four that talks about paths. So uh, that's a useful section of the book to read, is reasoning about paths, because that's what's going on here. It's kind of the compiler thinking about, is it possible that maybe there's a path through this where you don't give a value to change? Uh, that could be a useful piece of information that it's giving you. So that's a useful part of the chapter to read, is reasoning about paths. We, we don't have time to do more of it here in lecture, uh, but that's, uh, that's a good thing to review. Okay, so that was uh, some if-else examples, nested if-else, introduced some various ideas. What I want to do for the rest of the time is I want to discuss a sample program. Um, it's useful to know that I wrote this sample program specifically for this homework assignment. So I wrote it specifically to help you understand this homework assignment. I know people will ask things like, I mean, I, I'm not allowed to ask questions about the homework with my TA, uh, you know, or I'm limited in what I can ask about my homework solution. Uh, that's true, but you can talk endlessly about this sample program. So the sample program has a lot of the exact same issues as the homework assignment, and you can discuss it you know, it's, uh, forever with your TA or even with other students. The sample program, not the homework. So it's a program that, uh, that asks for information uh, to be able to compute uh, the body mass index, the BMI, of two different individuals. So it kind of asks for the height and weight of one person and the height and weight of a second person and then it reports what their BMI is using a government formula, and then the government tells us kind of a, a classification for that individual, you know, overweight, uh, underweight, obese, and so forth. They have uh, categories that they use for this. So uh, that's the program we wanna write. It is the chapter four case study. So uh, we're not gonna be able to do the whole thing here in the lecture time. I'm gonna try to hit the most important points and show you a final version of it. But this is a time when it really could be useful to you to read through this part of the chapter. It is the chapter four case study. It's just like your homework assignment. It has a lot of things in common with your homework assignment. So, you know, understanding it fully is gonna be very useful. I've written a kind of a, a beginner's version of this where I've put in kind of one person's worth of information. I'm prompting, I'm kind of doing these various things to get the height and the weight the formula for the BMI, and then I'm doing some uh, commands here that print out you know, what your classification is based on your BMI. So let's go ahead and uh, see how it behaves. Let's compile and run the code. So uh, suppose we had someone who was six feet tall. I guess that's 72 inches tall. 
225 pounds. They would say that that's a BMI of 30.512, a whole bunch of digits. Uh, we're going to want to change that. You'll notice that here it doesn't show all of those digits. So we'll get there, though. Um, well, let's try a few more. Let's see. What if the person was the six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds? Then they'd be classified as overweight. And if they were uh, six feet tall and 175 pounds, they'd be classified as the normal kind of overweight. And if they were six feet tall and uh, say 125 pounds, they would be classified as the underweight kind of normal overweight. Okay, clearly that's not the output that I want it to be doing. What did I do? I'm trying to reinforce the idea of nested if-elses. So I purposely did it the wrong way. I did if, 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 if. The idea is that I want to print exactly one of these messages. So uh, again, you need to think about uh, a case like this. What are the different possibilities? How many of them might you want to do? And then choose the right structure. So. Marty had told us that if you want exactly one, you use the nested if-else structure ending in else. That's that kind of bottom line way of looking at things, is that it's very practical. Think about how many cases, and then choose the right structure based on that. Else if is what I should have done there. This should be uh, an el else if. This should be, and this is the final branch, so this one should be uh, an else and then I can kind of turn this into a comment uh, instead of having it be a test. So that's the way I should have written it, is with nested if-else, so that it'll do exactly one of these things. So let's try compiling and running, and let's give it, again, say, the 72 inches and 125. That was the one that was printing out three of them, right? Because if, 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 it can, it can execute more than one of those things. Now it's only executing one, which is what we had in mind. Um, okay, well, let's take a look. The very first person's information was for 73 inches, 225 pounds. Let me type that into our code here. 73 inches, 225 pounds. And our program is reporting that as 29.68, et cetera. And what we want it to report is 29.7. So what we want to do here is something called rounding. We're going to want to round to the nearest one digit. So that's something, and you're going to be asked to do the same thing in your homework assignment, is round to the nearest one digit. How do we do that? Well, there was something called math.round. Uh, if I called math.round on this, it would round up to 30. It would say the BMI is a 30. So that's not what we want. I kind of want it to be rounding this part of it, you know, that the six gets rounded up to a seven. So again, normally if, this, if we were, uh, if I were doing this uh, with a live class, I'd ask you what to do. We, we do want to use math.round, but we don't want to round uh, the BMI one. What we want to do before we do the rounding is kind of shift the decimal over by one. We kind of want to turn this into 296.8. So we can do that here by multiplying by 10. So we'll take the BMI and multiply it by 10, and that'll be 296.81, et cetera. And we, when we round 296.8, it's going to round to 297. So that's going to get us kind of the right rounding thing. We do have to be careful. We don't want to give this person a heart attack that their BMI is 297. So we have to remember to divide that by 10 you know, before we're done. And that was inside of a printman. So this is a little formula that should do rounding to one digit. Uh, it it kind of it rounds to the nearest uh, digit. Uh, so if we did the 73 inches and 225 pounds, now it's rounding to the 29.7. So again, that's part of your homework, and that's how we would do something like that, is, is by uh, using a formula like that to round. OK. Uh, where do we go from here? It's supposed to do two people. So take a look at the, at the log, the sample log of execution. Uh, it's supposed to get the first person's information, then get the second person's information, 
then report the first person's information, then report the second person's information. So uh, over here, I'm gonna do it kind of the bad way first. I'm gonna make, oops, uh, copies of these lines of code, and I'm gonna come down here and paste that in. So I'm gonna have a second copy where let's say we'll make a height to and a weight to and a BMI to and a weight to uh, and a height, this is height to. So we'll kind of do a second person's worth of data, the exact same thing. And then in terms of reporting, we could take these lines of code here and we could come down here and paste in a second version and just change this all to be person two, it's going to be uh, rounding BMI two, we're going to be testing against whether BMI two is less than 18, whether BMI two is less than 25, whether BMI two is less than 30, uh, BMI two, we don't, the comment doesn't have to be changed, but we might as well. Uh, by the way, this is reminding me that I didn't, I was going to point out something to you. I, I got all of this from a government web page, you know, that's put out by the National uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, where they kind of tell you about the BMI. I actually think their their description here of these different you know cut points is is actually more confusing than what we're doing with our nested if else. I mean, think about it. What if your BMI is twenty nine point nine five? Then aren't you kind of in between here? You know, you're not really overweight, but you're not obese either. So actually, I think that that. Uh, you know, if, if they knew what they were doing and citizens would understand it, this is a much better way of kind of describing the BMI is using the nested if else structure uh, is to kind of show those different uh, breaking points. Uh, but anyway, let me compile, see if I made any errors in there. Uh, oh, I did make a mistake. That was supposed to be weight two, not weight 12. Uh, typing error on my part. Uh, let's see if we compile now. Uh, so let me scooch up here. Uh, and I'm going to say run, and I'm going to come back over here to, to remind myself of what's in the sample log. So the sample log, we did a 73 and a 225, and then there was 71 and 220, uh, and this is kind of what it reported as the results, 29.7 overweight and 30.7 obese. And that is, so that matches, that's the right thing. By the way, there's several different sample logs we give you for homework four, and the output comparison tool is going to let you be able to figure out whether you got them all just right. You know, so you're going to want to run samples like this and check and make sure that your program is behaving properly. Uh, but this program, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure we've got it. It's behaving properly. So this is a solution to the program. This would get all of what we call external correctness. It behaves properly but it's a horrible program. It's just a terrible, terrible program. It's ever, everything is in main. I don't have any methods other than main. Everything is in main. So I think that, uh, but you know, this isn't actually necessarily such a bad idea though. I mean, maybe you would write the program this way to kind of get it to work and know that it's working and know that you've worked out things like rounding and if else's and all of that kind of stuff before you dealt with the rest. I do think that the harder part for you is gonna be what we're gonna talk about next uh, it's the kind of the, what we call decomposition, the breaking it down into various methods. The assignment write-up is very clear that you have to have very short methods and that you have to have several of them. So I think I asked for five methods, you know, in total. So you're going to have to figure out some different methods to introduce and you're going to want to make sure that you're using them to eliminate redundancy and that's going to lead to the information flow issue. So that, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, I thought I'd mention, though, just, you know, as a bit of a tip, you know, there's some lines of output here. This is the little introduction to the program. So this is the easiest way to kind of get a method that gets you some credit, is that we could cut these lines of code from here, and we could introduce a public static void method that I could call, say, give intro. So we could make a give intro method, and we can put all those lines of code there. Uh, and they don't involve any variables. There's no, there's no variables being used there in the intro. So I can replace this with a call on give intro. Uh, 
and uh, that'll work just fine. I mean, I can go ahead and show you, but if I compile, uh, that doesn't introduce any problems because there's no, there's no information flow required. That's a simple method. That's like the chapter one methods. So uh, doing an intro, good idea, you know, uh, that's an easy one to do. This one is much harder, and this is the one that I want to spend more time on. So what I did is I took these lines of code and I copy-pasted them. And I've told you that if you find yourself doing copy-paste, you should feel that there's something wrong there, that you shouldn't, you know, there should be a better way. Uh, not always, but usually there is. So I'm gonna cut those lines of code and I want them to be replaced with a call on get BMI. That's kind of the idea, is I wanna be able to call a, a method instead. So what do we do down here? Let me do a public static void get BMI method. And let me come in here and let me go ahead and paste those in. So uh, that's, that's those lines of code. Now, if I'm gonna put it into a method, then I don't think I wanna say anymore like height one and weight one and BMI one. Let's, let's just use more generic names because we're gonna, the idea would be to write this method and to use it for both. You know, so I, I don't wanna kind of have these specific type names here. So let's use more generic names. So, and then the idea would be that once I have that, that get BMI method that I use to replace the first lines of code, that I can replace these lines of code by calling get BMI a second time. So I wanna call get BMI twice, uh, uh, instead of copy pasting chunks of code. Uh, I hope that by now, if you've been watching the Friday and the Monday lecture, you, you just know this isn't gonna work, you know there's gonna be more to the story than this, and it's gonna involve information flow. Uh, but let's just kind of uh, see where we stand if we ask the compiler, what does it think? And the compiler is, says, well, how can you be trying to print out a thing called BMI1 when you never declared a variable called BMI1? You know, and there's a bunch of complaints about that. Oh, okay, well, so I can't just get rid of BMI1. I have to have BMI1, and I, similarly, I can't just get rid of BMI2. I have to have a BMI2. So I'm gonna need those variables, you know, in order to keep track of, you know, on the first call on get BMI, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be storing that result in BMI1, and the second call I'm gonna be wanting that in BMI2. So we go ahead and hit compile. And now what it says is cannot find symbol uh, the console. So uh, the get BMI method is using the console scanner, uh, you know, that's to read in things like the height and the weight, you know, it's using the console scanner. Um, you might think about moving this line of code that constructs the console scanner into that method, but you're not allowed to do that. So again, a minor point, it's in the assignment write-up, but I'm kind of pointing it out to you, those of you who want to be very careful about these things, you're only allowed to construct one console scanner. So be careful about that. Don't construct more than one console scanner. You could think of this as being like graphics G in the graphics program. So we're gonna to wanna to construct it once in main and then pass it as a parameter. That's how we're gonna let these other methods know about the console scanner. So this is a common pattern. You set it up once in main and then you pass it to the methods that need the console scanner. So this get BMI method is gonna need access to the console scanner. So we pass it as a parameter. That's how we get it into the get BMI method, that part of it. Parameter passing uh, allows us to send a value into a method. Now we get a different error message in main where it's kind of saying, well, look, you know, you're trying to print this thing out, but BMI1 might not have been initialized. Hmm, BMI1 is not initialized. Well, I think that's true. You can see that I never gave a value to BMI1. Let me kind of say again that I think that there is uh, a similarity here with the analogy I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, that what if I had the laptop, you know, that was uh, trying to send a signal out, and then I have this console here, this, this uh, uh, apparatus here, that's ready to receive a signal, but I never connected the two together. 
That's where I think we're at. And this is one of the most important things to really understand. I've mentioned it several times in the recent lectures, but it's because this, I've seen so many students confused about this, it's really important to understand. So what's going on here? The GetBMI method is executing various lines of code and it computes a BMI that is needed later. So actually, I take it back. Uh, it's not quite yet where I wanted to be with the laptop because uh, it's not producing the output. So let's fix that part of it. Uh, we need to return BMI. We need to return that out of this method. The return type would be the type of that variable BMI, which is a double. Now it's like the Mac that's producing a signal. It's sending something out. But over here in Maine, you know, this thing that's coming back from get BMI the pizza's being delivered, something's arriving here for me to use, and I'm never actually connecting it to something in my main method. I never completed the connection. And the way we've been completing those connections is with assignment. That get BMI, like my Mac, top, uh, Mac laptop, you know, sending a signal out, that signal gets sent out and it needs to get connected to something on the other side. You complete the connection so that it's flowing into something. Here it's flowing into my variable called BMI1 in main. And similarly here, I want this uh, to be assigned in that way. I want that to flow into uh, the BMI2 variable in main. So this is a really important part uh, you know, to understand what's going on there. If that went a little too fast, review it in the chapter four case study, ask your TA about it discuss it with other students in the class. Again, the example program you can discuss, fine. Not the homework, but the sample program. Very important to understand those two lines of code and what's going on there, because that's the most complicated uh, information flow that's going on in this program. If I compile, I think I'll find now that it compiles properly, and I could run, and we'd see that, uh, that it's working out. Um, the uh, there are other things to do here. We want kind of more methods here. Um, we're coming up, we're kind of ending up with a really nice short main here. Give an intro, set up a console scanner, get the two BMIs. And I kind of like the idea of having a method that reports the results, the BMI1 and the BMI2, and then that's the end of main. This one is a really very nice main. We're not always going to be able to have such a nice short main, but for uh, for this example, for this programming assignment, we can end up with a very nice short main here. Uh, and I put the BMI1 here and the BMI2 here because uh, you know, I know that, uh, that in order to be able to report the information about those public static void report results, I'm going to have to pass into these methods, the BMI1 and the BMI2, into this particular method. So that's kind of a nice method to have that would do the reporting of these things. Obviously, there's a lot of redundancy here. We don't want to have that great big if else, you know, appear twice. So that's something to turn into a method uh, and work out the information flow and so forth. Uh, what I want to do is I want to, I'm going to kind of jump to the final version of this, which uh, is in the chapter and I'm going to put it on the, on the calendar for today. So it has that nice short main to it. Uh, there was the give intro, the get BMI that had in, you know, console flowing in, BMI flowing out. Um, uh, I'll get to this one in a second. There's the report results, and what I decided to do was to keep the print lens here. I could have put the print lens in the other one as well, but I kind of liked having the print lens here. And then reporting the status, I, I, I factored out that, that uh, great big nested if else, so that I, I wrote a method to do it, which I called twice. Now. There's a formula involved here. I used a formula given by the government that was on that page back here, where uh, it tells you the you know the formula is described. You know, uh, uh, maybe it's not on that page. Maybe I had to go to a different page. Oh no, I think it's, uh, there's a little link. Uh, oh no, anyway, uh, there, there's uh, uh, I went somewhere else, found the formula. But the point is that. You know, we saw a lot of these math class methods, things like sine, cosine, and so forth. If you're doing some kind of a computation, non-trivial computation, I think that's worth having in a method. So this is a method that's doing the BMI computation. Given a height and a width, width it has a uh, height and a weight, it has that formula, the government formula about how to compute somebody's BMI. And I did the same thing 
Oh, where did that little method go? It's down here for rounding. So instead of having the call on math.round, this little formula we did, instead of having that in the printlin, I made a method out of it called round one. You see, if you read the assignment write-up, the assignment write-up says you can use this method without modification in your homework assignment. So you're allowed to copy this method from today's uh, sample program on the calendar and just include that in your programming assignment for your rounding. So it's again kind of uh, a, 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 an interesting way to use a method to introduce a formula, to kind of capture a formula in a method. All right, uh, we'll, I'll say a little more about this example at the beginning of Friday's lecture, but that kind of completes what you need for the homework. So I'll see you next time.